Hello, Facebook Live. Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday, February 17th, uh, 2021. Um, good morning, everybody who's tuning in. I want to talk about E. coli today and uh, just explain E. coli. People have had questions over the many years, and somebody just recently asked me about um, about E. coli and steak and burgers. I just want to just want to do a, an explanation on um, E. coli, um, how it comes about, where it's found, um, why it's in produce, because it's typically something from cattle. Um, so I'm going to talk about that uh, this morning. If you're tuning in live, drop a comment, hashtag live. If it's on the replay, hashtag replay. Thank you, Susan, for doing that, dropping that before I even ask. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, gonna um, drop some um, information on E. coli here. I have, um, as a young chef, I was very heavily involved in um, one of the local processing plants in Colorado Springs when I worked there. Became very friendly with the owner, Frank. Um, in fact, uh, in the book Fast Food Nation, uh, he talks about Frank and his processing plant, Grendinger. Um, uh, beef, uh, Grindinger Processing in Colorado Springs. Became very, very friendly with Frank and learned a lot um, by um, just being around that um, that industry um, and working with Frank and doing 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 some collaborative projects. Um, became very good friends with Dale Lasseter from Lasseter Ranch. Uh, in the last chapter of Fast Food Nation, it talks about how there's hope in the world now and 90,000 acres in um, western Simla, Colorado, um, is dedicated to this, um, basically this, this wildlife um, sanctuary that raises cattle and has everything else going on in it, and it's really good. I learned a lot from Dale as well. Uh, Dale is um, uh, strictly grass-fed. He raises grass-fed beef, the beef master breed, and learned a lot from Dale. Um, so I'm gonna share this, some knowledge with you here today on E. coli and um, how we could avoid it, how you can avoid it, um, how cattle ranchers can avoid it, and why it's in produce. All right, so um, E. coli, E. coli 157, you see that beef is being recalled from E. coli, um, or produce has E. coli, they're talking about the E. coli 157 strain, the one that could be possibly deadly that does kill people. Um, so this is no, um, this is something serious. So. E. coli was not was not a concern a hundred years ago in the beef industry. It, it just it, it wasn't around like it what is today. In the '60s, the American beef industry started started heavily feeding their cattle grain, um, so corn grains. They started feeding them cereal grains. As a result of this, cattle started gaining a lot more weight. Farmers loved that. Um, up until the early 60s, um, beef was 100%, you know, it was, it was a grass-fed industry. You had grass-fed beef. It wasn't something that was marketed back then because it was just the normal. Uh, but with the greed that came in from the um, processing plants, the businesses, um, the beef packers, anybody who was involved, uh, especially the ranchers, wanted the cattle to weigh more. So how do you get the cattle to weigh more? Well, you feed them things that would make them gain weight, things maybe they should not be eating, like grain. Um, cattle, are, um, cattle are meant to eat grass. They are on grass pastures, just like bison, just like American bison. They are on grass pastures. They're meant to be fed grass and eat grass and graze or grazing animals. Also, on a side note, when you buy bison, most bison are grain fed. People assume that bison's being grass fed, grass finished. The definition, if anybody writes, whether it's a chef or a beef company, writes grass fed on the label of the beef on the menu, by law, by FDA, um, or US, USDA, and by the American Grass Fed Association, it has to be 100% grass fed, grass finished, zero, zero grain. It doesn't count if you have the cattle on pasture and you're supplementing a grain once a day, once a week. As soon as the animals start eating grain, they're no longer allowed to be marketed grass-fed. Now, a lot of chefs in restaurants are very confused by this, um, and um, they will they will tell you something's grass-fed and it's not grass-fed. So, they start feeding animals grains. Animals are not supposed to eat grains; supposed to eat grass. 
animals, the beef all of a sudden start getting big, heavier. They gain weight. Um, as a result, you have to start adding antibiotics because, you know, being overweight is being immune compromised. We've all learned that through COVID. If you were immune, com if you were overweight, um, you were more immune compromised and you're more susceptible to, um, to more intense COVID cases. So the same thing with cattle. Overweight, unhealthy, immune compromised, start pumping antibiotics in the cattle. Um, just normal. This is just now normal just to do this. Um, growth stimulants, things like that. Um, antibiotics also help cattle gain weight, believe it or not. Um, in fact, antibiotics are not really good to be used on a regular basis. It's a miracle drug when you need to kill something in your body and it's, it, antibiotics totally have their place. But the problem is most people abuse antibiotics. And what happens is your gut flora um, will turn into something that's negative, that has a lot more bad flora than good flora, um, good bacteria versus bad bacteria. And that can cause weight gain. That can cause um, poor digestion. It can cause a lot of things um, in a human. Well, the same thing in cattle. So now these cattle are getting bigger and fatter, immune compromised, uh, because they're eating grain, all right? Now, simple health. A lot of, a lot of nutrition-based medical doctors agree on this. The food transit time that you eat, when you eat food, the transit time from one end to the other end is super important for your health. The quicker the transit time, the healthier the food, the healthier you, okay? So transit time is key. If you're eating vegetables, now corn doesn't count because corn you can't digest. If you want to truly test your transit time, you would drink some, eat some beets or beet juice and see how fast it goes one end in one end and out the other. That's your true transit time. Um, so, um, and again, corn does not count because you can't digest corn in the skin and everything. It just passes through you undigested. So the quicker, the, the more food you eat that have the better transit time, the healthier you are. So now, if you were to take food that has a very slow transit time, now beef, if you eat beef, beef has a slow transit time versus broccoli. Um, it's just the fiber content, it's the way your body digests it. It takes a lot more energy to digest beef versus broccoli. So transit time's important. So now, imagine something sitting in your gut and fermenting for three days versus 12 hours. That transit time inside your body sitting at 98 degrees will start now creating different types of bacteria. Same thing with cattle. The cattle is eating grass or the cattle is eating grain. The cattle consumes grass, in and out, quick transit time, um, high pH, a lot of good things in the grass, a lot of good nutrients, um, a lot of, I mean, animals live off, live off of grass. Venison live off of, live off of grass. Um, so, now imagine start adding in grain to this cow's diet, the cattle, the cattle's diet. What happens then is, slows down the transit time, creates a different environment in the gut, the flora, good bacteria, bad bacteria, okay? And now it creates different strains of bacteria in there. And by feeding the cattle grain and slowing the transit time down and increasing the, the, what's in the digestive tract, the time that's in there, you create E. coli 157. That's where E. coli is created. If every single cattle in America were to be weaned off of grass for the last, um, off of grain for the last seven days of its life, seven full days of its life, maybe more, seven to 14, and I've been told this directly from cattle ranchers that are doing this. If you wean the cattle off for seven to 14 days, seven days, you will clean the digestive tract out of the cattle and not have E. coli present in the cattle. So when you go to the processing plant, the cattle will not have E. coli. So that's the first way to really, really avoid E. coli is by eating grass-fed beef. Ranchers that are doing the right thing um, is one of the big, big, this is the single biggest contributor to E. coli is the way we feed the cattle, the way we make them unhealthy, compromise, immune compromise, them, slow their digestive tract down and um, let the stuff just proliferate in there, okay? so. Now, to get grass-fed beef 15 years ago was a challenge. 10 years ago was a challenge. Now more and more producers, more and more farm hubs, more and more farmers out there are making grass-fed beef because people are aware of the health benefits, the higher omegas. I mean, just even talking nutrition-wise of grass-fed versus grain-fed is drastically different. Grass-fed beef has five times the amount of omega-3 heart-healthy fatty acids versus grain-fed beef. 
literally once you start feeding cattle grain, there, everything changes drastically with it. All right, everything changes. So, so um, if you're in really, really strict on health and you want to make sure you're eating the right thing, really look into true grass-fed beef, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, as opposed to grain-fed. The omega-6s and 9s are totally off whack in it um, compared, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not, the, everything's, things are off in this. But this is about E. coli, so I'll, st I'll stick to E. coli. There's a great book out there by Joe Robinson, Why Grass-Fed is Best, a little small pamphlet written back in the 90s. Um, I've had a couple copies here. Um, I've given them out. I don't think I have any more here. Um, but I used to give that book out really good book. All right. So now the diet of the cattle. Now in the processing plant, this is where E. coli can really get to the next step in the processing plant. If you're going to consume a steak versus ground beef, there's a drastic difference in the risk of E. coli. And here's why. What you will call primal cuts or the bigger cuts or the steaks. You cut a ribeye steak, you cut a strip steak. These are full pieces of meat. When you have a full piece of meat and eating it mid-rare or rare is totally different than eating a rare burger that was processed in the same plant. Here's what happens. Again, a lot of this is from greed. A lot of this is from greed. When you grind beef for ground beef, this is why there's such a drastic price difference in ground beef. Ground beef you can literally buy for, what, $1.99 a pound versus $10 a pound. The cheap ground beef, the cheap ground beef, they are using parts of the cattle that they would have never have used 40 years ago. They're cutting corners, they're using pieces, and they're, now they're pumping ammonia into the ground beef because they know that they're putting things into the ground beef that are dirty, that are contaminated. And so what happens when you take extra bits and pieces and parts of the beef during processing? You have possibility for E. coli to hit, hit, hit a cutting surface, a knife, a cutting board, a piece of meat might be might, might, have, might have touched the digestive tract um, of the animal. And then what happens? You take this beef and you grind it into other beef. So literally in these big processing plants in one burger, you will literally have the meat of up to a thousand cattle probably, 500 cattle, several hundred cattle can actually comprise one burger. That's how big these processing plants are. They process 400 animals an hour. So if one cattle has E. coli that is then contaminated by a careless worker or by cutting corners, now you have contaminated the whole batch of beef. So when they do beef recalls, this is why you hear, you know, 30 million pounds of beef, some astronomical number. Like, why is this such an astronomical number? Because one cow, one carcass, one bad employee, one bad practice can contaminate the whole batch. Of course, they can't take chances. So they have to do recalls. So eating a hamburger is far different than eating a steak because a steak, there's nothing has gone inside there. Nothing has been ground into it. Nothing's been put into it. All right, so it's a much, and when you cook a steak, you cook the outside. And by cooking it, you kill E. coli. This is why eating a rare burger or medium rare burger is a much higher risk than eating a medium rare steak. The outside of the steak is cooked and charred. E. coli, if, if E. coli even got on the outside of the steak as you cut it, you would kill it from cooking it on the grill. In the, in the burger, it's in the burger. So that is, um, that is totally, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's in there, it's in there. Bottom line, it's in there. So unless you're eating a well-done burger, you're increasing your risk. Now, of course, there are a lot of great options because you can go to your local farmer's market, you can call, you can contact the local farm hub, you can, you know, there's a lot of local things now where smaller scale production beef that where they take more care. But here, folks, you again, you get what you pay for. There's a direct correlation with the quality and the safety of the food you're buying with the price tag that's on it. Same thing with chicken eggs. The higher priced chicken egg, the better life the chicken had. That's just that's just the equation, that's just what happens. Cheap chicken eggs, it's all concentration camp chickens. Higher priced, and, and you can go up to $10 a, a dozen for eggs. Those are very happy chickens typically, running around, free roam. You know, the, the, there's a, a vast array of differences you can raise eggs. Eggsland Best Eggs, which came out in the late 90s. Um, they touted this omega-3 high, you know, egg, and they have all these things on it. If you were to do some research on Eggland's Best, well, first of all, it's sold in Walmart, so it has to be available at large scales, right? Um, they stamped a the little egg, egg, EB, Eggland's Best, and the package makes it seem like it's a legit egg. 
if you do some research, you will find out that those chickens are still put into cages, still stacked on top of each other, still going to the bathroom on top of each other, still in the... the They've, they've, they've tweaked a couple of things so, you, so that it sounds like a better egg. Maybe they've, they've added some omega-3s to the diet of the, of, of the chicken, which then goes into the egg. Folks, you are what you eat. We all are what we eat. So um, the Eggland's best. When people buy that, I'm like, honestly, they do great marketing, but that's probably the worst because they're very misleading on that, extremely misleading on the quality of that egg. Folks, you can now get eggs anywhere um, at a really high quality eggs, people have chickens, farmers markets, even some stores have, 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 have local high quality eggs in them. And of course, farm hubs and things like that. And even, um, community supported agriculture is a great way to get a lot of local food. So that's a rundown of, of, of E. coli in beef. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, how does spinach or romaine get E. coli in it? I don't understand that. How do almonds or other things get E. coli in them? So, because of the massive, massive agriculture we have set up here in the U.S., um, cows are out there in the feedlots. If you've ever been to a, a, a legit feedlot, like like big company feedlot, you can smell this feedlot for 30 miles away. The one in Colorado, in Montford, Colorado, Montford Beef, you can smell the feedlot. If the wind's blowing 30 miles away, you can smell this feedlot. The feedlot is five square miles. That's like bigger than Ellenville, right? So they jam pack 200 plus thousand cattle in that feedlot. These animals are crapping all over the place. They're sick. Um, they get taken off of small family farms. They get taken off of small family farms and, and they go through the process of going to an auction, going to a mid feeder, and then going to a finisher, which would be Montfort, IBP, International Beef Products, IBP. Um, there's a lot of them out there that, that do this. And these are the companies that are processing 400 animals an hour. When you have 200,000 animals sitting out in a feedlot right outside there in five square miles, you're, you're geared for high processing. In Montford, Colorado, in Montford, um, that beef processing, processing plant is atrocious. I remember late 90s when I was there, you know, you drive to that part of, of, of Denver and it's um, outside of Denver and it's just, it's atrocious. It's a disaster. But this is the reality of the stuff that most of us are buying in the grocery store because these are the ones that are producing the cheapest quality, cheap, cheapest price points. And when you go to the store and you see a ribeye steak or you see, you know, for $4.99 a pound or whatever, it, it, it's it's impossible to have quality at that price. So, um, so now how does produce get it? Now imagine there's not only one Montfort beef plant, there's lots of beef plants, facilities that have all these cattle concentrated throughout the U.S. Well, what happens when there's rainstorms, water runoff, this, e the, the, this crap, this cow crap, beef crap, has to go somewhere into the waterway system. So then it goes into the streams, the rivers, it gets into the water system, and it goes downstream maybe several hundred miles away, and then gets to, it gets to irrigate crops with it. If you've noticed, and I've said this many times before, there's two times a year when E. coli outbreaks happen in, in Romaine. And that's when the winter crop starts and ends. November, this November, it was a very, very mild e. e. coli outbreak. It made, it, I don't know if it really made mainstream media, but I saw it on some of the trade journals that I read that there was an E. coli outbreak, smaller scale, whatever. Um, so when we switched to the winter crop in Arizona, because of all the water runoff coming through, you know, Colorado and stuff, coming down into Arizona, that water is contaminated. Now, um, there's also a risk for E. coli in, in uh, Romaine in May. The beginning and the end of the season are the highest risk. I don't know why, but that's typically when that, that breakout happens, E. coli in, um, in, uh, in produce. But it can happen in spinach. It can happen in anything. Wherever there's water runoff coming from contaminated water, you can have E. coli. So that's how E. coli gets into food. Now, the government answer for this is, to keep pasteurizing our food, to keep making our food dead, to keep radi irradiating our food, right? They want to kill our food and kill everything in it. When you see the thing cold pasteurization, 
They just want to take our food and just kill it beyond belief to kill everything instead of improving the system and getting to the root cause of it. So now this is why almonds are almost impossible to buy without being chemically pasteurized in the state of California because they were convinced that the only way to logistically really solve the problem instead of solving the problem is to treat the problem and now kill your almonds with a highly toxic chemical to save you from the E. coli that supposedly is on them or whatever else. So they just keep processing our food more and killing our food more and irradiating our food more um, instead of really solving the problems and the issues uh, of, of what's really happening. So um, that's the rundown on E. coli, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, Try to make today very educational for people. Um, and of course, want you to encourage to eat as local as food as possible. Local is best, um, especially when you know the farmer, when you go to the farmer's market, especially when you have part of a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, and you buy a share into a farm. There are many of these in the Hudson Valley, many of these in the Hudson Valley. And these smaller producers, when they take cattle in to get processed, they're taking in two, three, four animals at a time. They're not, they're not mixing their animals with, with some big, large plant um, that has thousands of animals there. They're taking it to a small, hopefully family-run processing plant that's taking care of their product, that's, take, that's not cutting corners, that's, that's, uh, that's doing the right thing. There definitely is the price, I mean, you definitely pay, a, there is a price difference for the quality and the safety of the food you're eating. Um, that's just, you know, that's just the way business works. That is um, one of the business laws. You get what you pay for, right? So um, years and years ago, I was taught um, it's one thing to pay too much for something, but it's one thing to pay too little. Because if you pay too little and the product doesn't, doesn't fulfill the expectations, then in, in the restaurant world, we have to throw that product out and we have to spend more money on a better product. And then we spend more money, right? So you, you get what you pay for. You 100% absolutely get what you pay for. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Um, share this message with other people that are concerned, this, this video with other people that are concerned about uh, their health, about E. coli, or just want to be educated in general, um, other chefs, things like that. Encourage people to eat local. Um, encourage people to eat grass-fed if they can, uh, if, if they can find it, and it's more and more of it's available out there. Some of the grass-fed is available out there. It's a much better price now because it's available on a larger scale. Some countries still do grass-fed um, as, as the standard. Uh, for instance, like Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, these countries have never really switched to grain production. I'm sure they might be doing grain in certain areas, but these are known to be grass-fed um, producers. The countries are just known for that. So if you go to the grocery store, even if you go to ShopRite and you find their, like, I don't know what it's called, Nature's Reserve or something, it's probably Australian, Australian cattle, Australian beef. Now, there is a difference... Um, between um, regions where you can buy this. For example, New Zealand has lush green grass in a lot of these regions 24 months out of the year. Um, New Zealand can have lush green grass. Co um, um, if you're buying from Colorado or certain areas, there's definitely a season for grass-fed beef. So just like venison is in season in the fall time, grass-fed beef has a specific season because the grass-fed, the beef will graze on grass all summer long. And then from there, that was that the grass will plump them up naturally and let them be able to um, survive the winter. So some farmers will process most of their beef uh, in the fall time when the cattle hit their maximum weight from eating from eating lush green grass all summer, um, which means then the product goes into the freezer. Which nothing there's nothing wrong with that, um, but that's you know how how that cycle works. So a friend of mine. Um, who owns a massive amount of land in Argentina, like massive amount, um, um, like like legit, like one of the probably top five um, landowners in Argentina. He raises cattle, he has horses, plays polo, um, and uh, he comes up uh, some summers, was coming up some summers to play polo professionally for years. He says, Marcus, if I were caught giving my cattle in Argentina antibiotics... You kind of grow up. So if I was caught doing that, I'd be blacklisted for life on cattle. Nobody would nobody would buy my cattle in Argentina because of that. Because I was cutting corners and doing that. They take it very very strict down there of what they do. Certain countries are just like this. So um, of course America, the U.S. 
is probably the worst because we have the most corporate greed, um, the most money hungry right corporations out there um, that really don't care about our environment, that really don't care about our health, although they care about bottom line profit. So um, this is, and this is like this with the, several other countries too. If you look at ingredients here versus ingredients in England for the same exact product, Italy, you will see difference that they'll omit the corn syrup in Europe. They'll give us the corn syrup. So you just look at two of the same products. You, you go pick up Oreos here and Oreos in, in Europe. It's, it's two different formulations to come up with the same product. Now, why aren't they giving us the same product here? Because our government hasn't banned those chemicals yet and those preservatives and whatever's the funky stuff in there. Our country hasn't banned those yet. So the corporations know they can put cheap stuff in there and get away with it and they don't, they're not held accountable. So um, when we go to Italy, a food is very different when we go when we, when we when we do our Italian wine tours, when we take guests with us. People say, Oh my gosh, I can eat pasta, I can eat wheat, I can eat this, I can eat that. The food is just different. I don't you know and that's the one thing people say with us when they come to, to Aroma Time is I just feel like the, the my the, the food, I don't feel I'm full, but I don't feel full and bloated. Um because we're very, very, very strict on on all that kind of stuff that, that um, you know, I had a conversation with a local farmer last week about sriracha sauce. Most restaurants buy sriracha sauce, which is the chicken one, with the chicken on it, right? Um, that big brand. Have you ever turned the ingredients over and looked at the ingredients on that sriracha sauce? There's chems and preservatives in there that you probably should not be eating, that I know you shouldn't be eating. So I was having a conversation, and they're like, like if I go buy a wholesale, they're like $2 a big bottle. I paid for a very, very small bottle last week, an eight ouncer, five ninety nine from the farm, from, from the farm hub, uh, five ninety nine for a small. So it was a lot more money, and I and I had a conversation with with the farm that was producing it, and you know, and I said thank you for not putting chems in there, and she goes thank you for noticing that. She goes, nobody really ever says anything about that, and you know, and they, but the big brand is loaded with chemicals, preservatives. Um, things that you should not be putting into your body. So you get what you pay for. So when people say, oh, Aroma Time's expensive, I wish I could buy $2 bottle Sriracha versus Sriracha that's really five times the price based upon the volume of the bottle. I wish I could buy, th but it's just, it's not our passion. Um, our passion is to be able to eat our food comfortably, knowing everything I know here, um, everything I know on food and nutrition. When all this first went down many, many years ago, I was uh, very overweight, asthma, immune compromised, um, prescription deodorant. I mean, I, I was a disaster in health. And I was so fed up with the doctor just saying, oh, you're okay, here's another pill. You're okay, here's another pill. It stopped when my cholesterol hit 225 and I said, no more doc, I'm gonna figure this out. I, I, I'm in Colorado, I've, I'm, uh, I, I, I've started reading a book, Be Well, Be Wise by Dr. Bernard Jensen. And I said, I think I can figure this out. And he gave me 30 days to figure everything out. and. I totally immersed myself into, into, um, into nutrition, alternative nutrition. In fact, the book that I read that changed everything for me was Get Healthy, Get Now. I read this book, and this totally changed my perspective on food. Get Healthy, Get Now. This is from 2000, 1999, maybe. Get Healthy, Get Now. And I got so much into it, so much into it, that I actually started writing uh, for that author. I started writing for Gary Null. So in this book here, Power Aging, released in many, many, many countries, um, bestseller. All the recipes in here are mine, um, 100 or so recipes in the back. And my name is credited in the book on this, um, Power Aging. This was written in 2003. This came out, 2003, 2002. Um, so within the first three years, I totally immersed myself into this, into this diet and nutrition. And um, I went from reading his book, reading his book, to actually getting his attention so I could actually contribute to one of his books. So, but that was a life changer when I read that book. Um, really laid things out for me, uh, what was happening in our food supply, what was happening, it was just, every, it, was, it, was, it was a game changer. So, um, thank you everybody for making comments this morning. Um, I can't really read all the comments. I know there's a lot coming in. Um, I appreciate all the comments. I appreciate the support, Jamie. I appreciate your support at the restaurant, online, virtually. We really do. We couldn't be here without you. Um, our goal here is, since day one, 2003, was just to be able to, to provide good, 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 um, well-balanced food. Um, food that's not, you know, 
over fried, over stuffed, over chemicalized, over pasture, all these things. This is, and that's been our goal since day one is to be able to walk into our restaurant, our restaurant, and be able to eat the food that we're serving to you. Um, before the restaurant, um, when, I would, when we would go out to eat, it was very hard for us to go out to eat, especially with friends. As friends would say, oh, we want to take you here, we want to take you here, we want to take you there. And, and I, knew, I knew it was in the food supply. I'm like, eh, you know, it's just, it, this is crazy. Um, why should I be eating this food? And I said, we just need a restaurant. This was before Roman time was even in, in thought process. You know, I knew I wanted to open a restaurant at some point. And we just need a restaurant where we can just go eat the food freely and not have to worry about questioning what's in the food and being able just to trust somebody. And there are chefs out there that, that, that are on the same mission as us and, and we applaud them and there are some chefs that they're doing, they're doing some great stuff. Um, some chefs started out doing this and some chefs switched once they realized it's hard to make money on this and the food costs so much more and this and that. Um, but you know, that's our mission is we want to be able to eat all the food that we serve here to, for, our own, for our own selves our own family because we're not the restaurant owners that go to Whole Foods to purchase. There's a lot of restaurant owners like this, a lot of very successful restaurant owners like this that will go and buy food, um, successful as in financially successful. I feel being we're doing what we're doing is a very successful business model, but they would, you'd seem like these guys have it totally set up and great restaurants and they go to Whole Foods for their family, but then the restaurant, they will bid out the cheapest eggs to get the cheapest possible eggs there, the cheapest milk there, the cheapest cheese there to serve in their restaurant that's charging you a lot of money, same prices as me or more than we charge. Um, and they're taking that, that, all that profit and just you know taking care of themselves but not taking care of our, the guests. So that was our main goal when we opened in 2003 was to really have, be on top of all of this um, and to earn your trust. And um, my last Instagram post was trust. Um, my personal Instagram, one chef on a mission. Um, the word trust was my last post. I think that that's the most important thing in all of business is to trust the people you buy from. Um, I know for me, when I bought things, whether it's a car, this or that, the salesman might be knowledgeable, the salesman might be friendly, but if you don't trust that person, if you don't trust that person, it's useless, totally useless. And I've bought stuff from people that I've gotten, I've been okay with what I bought, but I haven't, I said, you know what? I don't trust them enough to go back to them the next time. There's something about them I don't trust, right? They're not telling me the whole story. They're not, you know, years ago, four or five years ago, somebody goes, I'm looking, they come into the restaurant, I'm looking for cans. Uh, I'm doing a project. I said, you need cans? I said, okay. I took them outside of the dumpster. We opened up the dumpster and I said, here's, and the guy was like, I'm so shocked. I haven't had any restaurant open their dumpster for me. Like, we're not hiding anything. Go in my dumpster and look now. You'll see all the cans of organic chickpeas. You'll see all the cans of organic coconut milk. You'll see, you'll see everything there. Um, you know, most restaurants will not want you to go to the dump. You'll see my organic sunflower oil containers sitting out there. You'll see all the stuff that we use in our restaurant. And because of that, when you walk into the restaurant now, you can see everything we use in the kitchen because it's a grocery store now. You want the same coconut milk we use, the organic coconut milk that cost me $91 a case versus 45 a case for a conventional? It's sitting there, that's what we use. And you'll see my kitchen staff, when they need the rice crackers that have no chems in those kame rice crackers that's in the stores, they're even sold in Whole Foods, chemicals, uh, I wouldn't serve them, I wouldn't eat them. You'll see somebody from the kitchen walk out and grab the organic Edward and Sons brown rice crackers. There's water, brown rice flour, and one other brown rice product in those brown rice crackers. That's it. You go to Kame, K-A-M-E, you look at their stuff, it's loaded. It's, 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 you can even buy those in Whole Foods. They call it a natural food, and it, it's not. It's, it's, it, 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 there's chemicals in it, there's preservatives in it. So you'll see our staff walk out there um, and... Uh, and take it into the kitchen and cook it. So, you know, trust, trust, trust. So, all right, folks, I gotta go. Um, thank you, everybody, for your support. Really, really appreciate it, and hope to see you soon. Uh, drop a comment, say hello here, share this with anybody um, who is in the food industry, who's concerned about their health. And I hope this was, edu if this was educational for you on E. coli, just drop me a comment, say yes. It was educational on, on E. coli. Uh, e. coli is often misunderstood by people. So, um, and um, it's really misunderstood where it really comes from. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.